So welcome to our uh, penultimate colloquium of the fall semester at the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I'd like to take note of Dan Patricia for her organization and Hugo Barreca for his continuing support. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, I'm especially delighted to um, have here one of our own um, graduates of the CUNY philosophy program. Um, Matthew Rector received his PhD in 2019 uh, from the program and was a fellow of our Center for Global Ethics and Politics. So every year I have one of the fellows come back and give a talk, and um, this is our annual speaker uh, from that group. Um, he's currently a lecturer at Douglas College in Canada. Uh, and he's taking up a habilitation fellowship at uh, the Free University of Berlin starting in February, uh, April of this year, sorry. Um, Matt's work uh, focuses on how we act together and what we owe each other when we do. And occasionally he dabbles in experimental philosophy, as you will hear tonight, that is a trend, um, one of the trends in our program. Um, his papers have appeared in news. He has a paper there uh, that's a very leading uh, one of the leading philosophy journals. It's called Conditional Intentions and Fair Agency, somewhat based on his thesis. Okay. Right. And he's also published in Philosophical Orderly, Mind and Language, Social Theory and Practice, and the Journal of Political Health. Mm -hmm. So um, we're really delighted to uh, welcome you tonight. As usual, we will have our talk followed by a Q and A, followed by the best reception ever. <laughs> so the best ever, and that will be down in fifty two oh three. You can just follow us down there. We would also like to welcome um, our uh, visitors on Zoom, especially Virginia and Bruno, and it's great to see you. So the talk today is called "Better Together: Shared Agency Versus Strategic Interaction." Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, both in person and online. And a special thanks again to Carol for the invitation. Um, this is a very special invitation for me. As you just heard, I was a student here. I came to these talks when I was a student. Oh, I forgot to say he was a basketball player on here. <laughs> pro basketball player in his early That's <laughs> what I did before I came here. Um, and these were always highlights of my semester. I enjoyed the talks. I thought the discussions were excellent. And I hope the speakers gained a lot from them. I feel like they did. So I'm very much looking forward to presenting some new work for you here today and hearing your thoughts about it, your suggestions, comments, questions, and so on. My talk today is going to concern two ways that we can act together. I mean by that two things that we do non-distributively, so things that can't be attributed to any individual agent, and things that require for the outcome to come about, that each, each sees the attitudes of the other as part of producing that outcome. I'm also going to present some experimental results that aim to explore how people conceive of these two kinds of sociality. Those results are the product of a collaborative project with Javier Gomez Lavin, who is also a CUNY graduate. And so very early versions of this, not this specifically, started when we were both graduates. It's especially important for that reason too. For me. I should mention that Javier is responsible for the experimental design and statistical analysis. So I'll do my best to present those things, but I can't really answer detailed questions if there are mistakes in that part of the research. What I'm going to focus on is the philosophical background and then what I think the philosophical conclusions are that we can draw from that research. The main thought is that we can draw a contrast or a distinction between an outcome brought about by way of strategic reasoning and one brought about by sharing agency. The talk is divided into three parts. The first part sets up the background, explains the kind of theoretical framework I'm using for making sense of this distinction. The second describes our experimental research, and the third outlines the conclusions I think we can draw. We have some results for the initial studies, but I think this work is still in early stages. So this last part is going to be a little bit speculative, and I'd be particularly grateful to hear your thoughts about how to locate, extend, or perhaps even deepen the project. 
some direction. So let's start with part one, two forms of sociality. The background assumption here is something that I've been calling constructivism. It's the idea that there are different forms of sociality or togetherness that we can understand using psychological modeling. There are three stages to this kind of project. The first is to catalog features of social interactions, behavioral terms. The second is to create a model agent. So this is a hypothetical structure that's aimed at explaining some target system. And in our case, the structure is an agent with certain capacities. I think this methodology gets used across the social sciences. In the philosophical tradition, to my mind, I locate it first with Rice and the project of creature construction, but I don't think it's limited to the philosophical tradition. And then the final step is to describe sets of mental states of that agent that would explain those interactions. So we're looking for mental states such that if the agent were in those states, they'd be poised to engage in interactions with those features. That's the way that I'd like to understand these two forms of sociality. So I think both of the things that I'm going to talk about today can be constructed in this way, and I'm going to go through those steps for each. The first kind of sociality is strategic interaction. This is the kind of sociality that a certain brand of game theory focuses. Some examples from game theorists are likely very familiar. So you've all heard of the prison dilemma and so on. I think this also applies in coordination games. A kind of neutral example of a coordination game is avoiding a collision with somebody on a crowded street. That's not a distributive action. It's not true of any individual that they avoid a collision. It's something that people do together in some sense. So it's a form of sociality. And yet it doesn't seem to involve anything more than reasoning strategically about what the other is likely to do. I think abstracting from the details of any specific game, this kind of strategic reasoning is a common way that we interact with others, in particular, a way that we interact with strangers. The behavior of characterization of this in general terms involves two main things which lead to a kind of particular kind of outcome. The first is mutual responsiveness. So when we avoid a collision, we adjust our own behavior in light of the other person's behavior and mutual mind reading. So we also try to work out what the other person is thinking, what attitudes they have. And that's part of the way that we form our decision about what to do. We're doing all of this in a way that tracks a particular outcome. That outcome is such that neither of us could do better by unilaterally changing our behavior. So if we're passing each other on the right, if I suddenly decide to go to the left, I'm going to be worse off than same for you. This is a best response outcome. So each of us is doing the best we can in light of what we think the other will do. The other is doing the same. That each of us is doing so and can recreate the reasoning of the others is common knowledge. The kinds of theoretical pauses that people influenced by game theory put forward to explain this kind of interaction involve a few things. I'm going to simplify them somewhat dramatically. But I think they do capture what, in general, game theorists are committed to. So the first is that an agent prefers some state of the world over others. And without getting into any of the details, under certain conditions, that set of preferences can be translated, can be mapped onto the real numbers, which creates a utility function, gives us payoffs in the game. Essentially, in sort of bulk terms, this is what an agent wants. But an agent can't choose consequences directly since they don't always know how things will turn out. So they also have a set of expectations about the likelihood of each available action leading to its various possible outcomes. That gives us a probability function with representation theorems. These can be combined into what's called expected utility theory. Agents also have strategies. These are predetermined programs of play that tell the agent what actions to take in response to every possible action of the other players. And there's a kind of assumption of rationality in a certain sense. So agents select actions from a set of alternatives, which are gonna call that choosing an action that yield their most preferred outcome given the actions of the other agents. So the best response outcome that I described is the result of a kind of best response reasoning process that the agent is undertaking. We can look at one example in detail, I think this later on. 
This is a aggression, non-aggression game called Hawk Dove. It's been very useful in evolutionary game theory for modeling organisms who come into conflict over some resource. But it has also been used to characterize adult human behavior in some contexts, including writing papers together in academia, <laughs> chicken, <laughs> interesting. Um, all of the things that I just described are embedded into this matrix. So hawks are aggressive. They try to get some resource and are willing to fight for it. If the other person is trying to get it as well, doves offer to share the resource and back down if the other attempts to take it all. Fighting is costly to both parties. So the options for actions that the agents have are dove and hawk. The numbers in the cells are payoffs. Those payoffs are given by the agent's utility functions, the state of affairs corresponding to the outcome in question. Sharing the resource leads to a payoff of two for each. Getting the whole resource leads to a payoff of three. Getting nothing leads to a payoff of zero. And fighting leads to a payoff of negative five. So if the agents are game theoretic, rational agents, where do we end up? Remember the Nash equilibrium involves a kind of best response reasoning. So given one agent's expectations about what the other agent will do, they choose a strategy that will bring about the best result. In this case, that's going to be either the bottom left, which is hawk dove, or the top right, which is dove hawk. As a kind of intuitive picture of why this is the case, we can simply think about whether or not an agent can improve their payoff by changing strategies. So if we go to the hawk dove equilibrium there on the bottom, and we think about what agent A can do, if they switch from hawk to dove, they switch from a payoff of three to two, and so they're worse off. And the same is true for agent B. If agent B switches from dove to hawk, then they go from a payoff of zero to a payoff, payoff of negative five. So neither can improve their outcome by changing strategies, which means this kind of outcome has a kind of stability that other outcomes do not. And the same is true for this. You can go through the exact same kind of reasoning, but it's not true, say, for dove dove. If we're on that top left corner, either agent can switch strategies and improve their payoff. So that's not a stable outcome. So that's the kind of interaction that I think we can construct in this way. I think it's no doubt an informative model of an important and widespread kind of sociality. And yet these people are not acting together. We see it as a model for human behavior. These people are not acting together in the sense that interests many philosophers. Best response reasoning doesn't seem to capture what's happening when you say, walk through an art gallery with a friend looking at paintings. Some philosophers argue that you can have a different relation to the outcomes that you bring about together. Some examples they've given are trips to the beach, with family and friends, pick up basketball games with strangers, also committing armed robbery with accomplices. So these are all things that you can do together with others in a sought after sense. The idea is that it's a more robust pattern of interaction. The central thought guiding many of these philosophers work is that we can aim at outcomes with others. Those outcomes can be the objects of commitments that we have, rather than just side effects of each individual reasoning in a particular way, which is what's going on in the Nash equilibrium. So Nash equilibria are side effects, whereas shared agency involves committing ourselves. And those commitments have certain distinctive behavioral features that are distinct from what's going on in shared interaction. The behavioral characterization that philosophers often offer involves something like interpersonal, interpersonal coordination of action, tracking a shared goal. This is going to be in addition to mutual mind reading and responsiveness, of course. Also joint deliberation, negoci negotiation, and support, which will be distinct from shared interaction as well. So what do action theorists and social ontologists say that we need in order to understand this kind of interaction, they suggest that we have to posit something like intention. Intuitively, we can understand intention as the state in virtue of which a person can be said to have made up their mind about what to do. Intentions are commitments to act. They have two components. One is causal force. So intentions tend to cause us to behave, given the kinds of agents we are. And when they're successful, they do. Intentions also play a particular role in our practical reasoning. 
When we have an intention, we tend to see the deliberative question as closed, at least for the time being. And that has effects about other actions that we plan, other things that we aim at doing, and so on. But many philosophers think we need more than just a concept of individual intention. We also need a concept of shared intention. Shared intentions play all of the same roles as individual intentions, but instead of playing those roles within a person over time, they play those roles across people. There are lots of different views in literature, of course. I'm going to focus on one a bit later when we come to the experimental research. But my favorite view is that we have a conditional, so we have a collective intention when we each have conditional intentions about a shared activity where the condition on each intention is the matching conditional intentions of the other participants. Some theorists also think that shared agency requires positing the ability to employ certain normative concepts like obligations, rights, and entitlements. So we have a conception of what we ought to do. And sometimes at least we're motivated to engage in shared things that would add up to shared agency because of that conception. That's going to come up again in our experiments. So we have these two distinctive forms of sociality that have different behavioral characterizations. We have two different psychological models that we can use for explanations of these kinds of sociality. And there's a kind of conflict here between the game theoretic, broadly speaking, understanding of one kind of sociality and the action theoretic or social ontological side. From the philosopher's point of view, Sometimes there's no way to model shared agency using only the resources of game theory. Some have claimed that those resources simply won't capture the distinctive behavioral features of shared agency. Instead, something like a shared intention must be posited, and that would require a significant addition to the ontological commitments of game theory. Versions of claims like this can be found in Michael Bratman. Ryan Tomala and Margaret Gilbert. But some game theorists and philosophers heavily influenced by game theory deny this claim. They say that we can understand this and other forms of sociality purely in terms of utility, probability functions, and Nash equilibria of different kinds of games, not directly and in the service of a kind of modification that I'm going to talk about later, but I take people like Gold and Sugden to have suggested this, also Chant and Ernst. So that's the basis of the hypothesis we need to investigate, which is this claim, which I think we can attribute safely to several philosophers. Strategic interaction and shared agency are two distinct forms of sociality. How can we resolve this disagreement? This is maybe not the ideal way, but it's the way that's available to me. We are going to use experimental philosophy to do so. <laughs> So Javier and I investigated this using the empirical methods common to social psychology. Uh, the reason that we thought initially this is useful is that it's quite common in the philosophical literature on this topic to appeal to intuition when making this claim. So people will give a case of shared agency and then give a case of strategic interaction and point to our intuitive response to those two cases and use that partially as the basis for the claim that they are distinct. So at the most minimal level then, it seems useful to know, does that intuition extend beyond the profession? What happens when we expand the sample sizes to something that is scientifically valuable and so on? So that's the initial motivation. I'm gonna now turn to describing the experimental research. So what we're actually testing is a little bit more specific given the methodology that we're using. What we're actually testing is whether this action theoretic model is actually embedded in our folk psychology. After we have some results on the table, I'm going to spell out in more detail how I think we can get from this claim to the one about shared agency actually being distinct. The basic thought to preview a little bit is that if our conceptual scheme includes the action theoretic model and that conceptual scheme plays some role in generating behavior, then attempts to explain shared agency without appealing to some of those theoretical posits will have difficulties. I'm going to start by describing some earlier research because there are two lessons from it that I think are important for the current research that we're doing, and it gives a picture of the kind of approach that we're taking. 
One thing that it does is help bring out the properties that we can use to distinguish between shared agency and strategic interaction. And another purpose, I think, is that it helps frame what we take the point of this research to be. So in our earlier research, we wanted to test different claims about what people owe each other when they act together. We can divide the theoretical literature into two groups, I think, for doing so. On the one hand, there are normativists like Margaret Gilbert, who argue that shared intentions are inherently normative. So coming back to the point I was making earlier, they think there are obligations, rights, and entitlements in shared intention. And the non-normativists are represented by Michael Bradman and I this way. They say that shared intention is a social psychological phenomenon. It may have some obligations in some cases, but it's not an inherent part of shared intention. Both of these sides use thought experiments to make their claim. So our first research tried to get at this question using those thought experiments. So we had a walking vignette, which created one of the conditions that we used. Participants were randomly assigned different conditions. This comes directly from the work of Michael Bratman. He uses it as a case of shared agency without interpersonal obligation. The case is as follows. Two people are independently walking down Fifth Avenue. They spot each other at 65th Street, and they briefly walk together chatting until, as it happens, one of them peels off at 59th Street. So this is from one of Bradman's papers. He says, clearly they have a shared attention, but they also clearly do not have any interpersonal obligation. And so we have a case of shared agency without any normative relation between them. Margaret Gilbert tells a very, very similar story. It's almost identical, the names are changed, and says, the fact that the person who is left behind feels like they have the right to ask the person where they are going shows that there is an interpersonal obligation between them. So we have kind of competing thought experiments, and we thought we'd take this Bratmanian case, take away some of the behavioral cues to get a control condition, add some behavioral cues to get a hydrogen action condition, and see whether or not people judged it to be a case of shared agency, and if so, whether they also judged that there were interpersonal obligations. So that was our measure. The measure of whether or not this is shared agency, we tried to track with the idea of togetherness. So to what extent are the two people acting together? And then we wanted to test this one obligation to notify, which isn't exactly what Gilbert says. She has a much stronger picture. We took this to be a more plausible kind of obligation that we looked at, and one that Bratman denies. Here are the results, focusing on the togetherness measure first. These are box plots. So the box represents the interquartile range, which is the middle 50% of the data. The horizontal line in the middle is the median. The Xs are the means. The vertical bars coming out of the top are the so top 25% of responses, the bottom 25% of responses. And we can see that there's a strongly significant difference between the control condition and the low condition, which means that our participants did recognize the difference between these two things. So this is kind of a manipulation check. Are the vignettes we're giving them actually tracking shared agency or not? It looks like they are. This was the key measure, and the results here are very stark. So as soon as we move from the control condition to the low condition, people judge there to be an obligation that wasn't there before. So it really does look like the obligation to notify was present in this case. Javier assures me that both of these are strongly statistically significant. Um, and so we took this to be evidence that, at least according to our folk psychological model, in the case that Bretman explicitly tells as an example where there are no obligations between the participants, there is, according to that folk psychological understanding, which says something about the theories. So participants are sensitive to the summary that we take from that research is that participants are sensitive to minimal cases of shared agency, and also that they are very set to detect normative relations amongst joint actors, despite sort of non-normativist claims. The lessons that I'd like to draw from that for the current research is that the presence of certain normative relations between participants is sometimes a reliable indicator of shared agency, and that we're probably best off if we see this kind of experimental research as a prompter guide for theory development, revision, or selection. So we don't take these results to have disproven non-normative. 
There are several reasons for this. One is the non-normative claim is simply that there is one case of shared agency that doesn't involve interpersonal obligations. One could always propose new cases, in which case we'd be happy to test those ones too. Another possibility is that there's further normative theorizing that could be done about the relationship between shared attention and whatever obligations we have. And so Bradman has suggested that some instances of shared agency involve, say, something like promising mutual assurance. He just took this to be an example of one that didn't involve those further normative principles. So it's always open to a non-normativist to propose some other explanation of why this particular case. We just think that until they do so, this is a useful sort of spur to action. That's the role we think that experimental research can play here too. We don't think that this research will settle the question in any way, but we do think that whether these abstract models capture something in our book psychology is potentially valuable for understanding human sociality. And if one is shown to have a much stronger grounding in that folk psychology, it's at least a reason in favor of it for the time being. The first thing we wanted to do in this research was to find a kind of lowest common denominator in the distinction between strategic interaction and shared agency. That is, what's the minimal case of shared agency? The weakest version of it, the one that's closest to strategic interaction, because then if we find that there's still a difference, it looks like that is much stronger. If we find that there's not a difference, then we can test a stronger version. And we thought that Bratman's version is the one that's closest to strategic interaction. So we'd build our experiment based on the specific arguments and features of his theory. He is also one of the people who has done the most to develop the kind of distinctiveness claim I've been pointing out here. So he has explicitly engaged with arguments that claim that his theory reduces to Nash equilibrium and has pointed out several things that he thinks make that claim false. So not only is it the kind of minimal view, it's also the one that's most engaged in this debate. For Bratman, it's a kind of gloss. Sharing an intention is a matter of having a series of interlocking, interrelated individual intentions that concern the other's participation, so their action, and also their intentions. So each has an intention towards the shared activity, and each has an intention towards the other's behavior in accordance with the shared activity and with the other's intentions in accordance with the shared activity. Essentially, we have intentions about our own behaviors, the behaviors of others, and others. For Bratman specifically, these intentions are grounded in dispositions that we have as agents uh, and are tied to certain rationality requirements on intention in general. So his argument relies on this difference between expectation and intention. And that maps very nicely onto the different theoretical posits of these two views. So most simply stated, according to the game theoretic model, when we reason strategically, we have an expectation about the other's behavior. Whereas according to Bratman's model of shared intention, we have an intention about the other's behavior and intentions. These are two very different kinds of attitudes. An agent with an expectation, more or less, has a belief about what's going to happen in the future, but they might not be committed to that thing at all. In fact, they may strongly prefer that it not happen. I might expect that I'm going to forget to take out the garbage, but I certainly am not committed to that. I don't want that to happen. An agent with an intention is in a very different situation. They are committed to bringing that action about. And so they see that practical question of whether to do that thing as closed. That has a bunch of behavioral features. Bradman suggests that they will resist certain temptations, that they'll track the success of that plan, that they'll adjust things to keep everything on the course, and so on, which is not the case for my expectation about forgetting to put the garbage, for example. So he uses that difference to argue that there are certain behavioral, specific behavioral features that are present in shared agency, but not strategic interaction. The first is that agents in shared, agent, shared agency will tend to, and are actually required to, filter incompatible options. So if you're committed to bringing about some outcome, it's always open for you to reconsider your intentions, but without reconsidering your intentions, you won't undertake actions that would make it impossible to bring that outcome about. Or at least if you do, you might see that as a mistake. Second, you will support co-actors. 
So since you have an intention that other people perform their parts, means and rationality requires of you that you help them perform their parts, otherwise your own intention will not be satisfied. And third, on Bratman's view, these agents will also be flexible about roles. So because you have an intention about the other's participatory intentions, you'll make sure that you negotiate and deliberate about how to perform the actions to ensure that the other person maintains their intention, and that will involve being flexible about which role which will play in the shared agency. So in essence, these form a kind of common core of normativity. Every theorist, every major view of shared intention causes these things. So even Gilbert says we have these behavioral features. She just thinks we have these on a different basis. We have them because of joint commitment, and she thinks we have more in addition to these. Consider for a second how different this is than the hawk dove game. So a dove will not be disposed to be flexible about roles to help the hawk or to filter inconsistent options. Each person clearly prefers to be the hawk in the national equilibrium and pay off his vigor. So there'll be no flexibility. Given any chance to undermine the person in the hawk role, the dove will, since they would prefer to be in the hawk position than the dove. And since the payoff at hawk dove is zero, there is no incentive to filter out options and be compatible with the national equilibrium. Therefore, according to Bratman, people engaged in the kind of best response reasoning that leads to the best response outcome in this kind of situation are not engaged in shared agency. So we have a clear set of behavioral responses that would differentiate between strategic interaction and shared agency with regions lifted. And we have the difference in psychological model that would account for these behavioral features, the difference between shared intention and best response reasoning. We use those as the basis for our new research. This study was a two by one between subjects design. We had two vignettes, the strategic reasoning vignette and the shared agency vignette. We randomly assigned participants 60 in each group to one of the categories. I have the full vignettes on a later slide if you would like them, but it takes a little bit of time to read them out. They're a bit long, so I thought I would just describe them. There are two bagel shop owners, Tom and Sally. Uh, Sally has gluten-free and sort of fancier like bagels. Tom has sort of traditional bagels, which caters to a kind of working class audience. In the strategic reasoning case, each individually thinks about what bagels to sell and how to price the bagels based on their expectations about what the other shop owner will do. And in the shared agency case, they form a shared plan to keep the price at a particular level and divide up the customer base by selling different kinds of bagels. In both cases, that price is the same. So it's the exact same outcome. They're trying to get a price of $3, but in the first case, it's a side effect of best response reasoning, and in the second case, it's the outcome of a shared plan. So then after reading the vignettes, we divided the participants again, gave them further prompts to give them a hypothetical situation that tests the measures that Rapid says will be present. So we had a disposition to help prompt, a filtering prompt, and a flexibility prompt. The disposition to help prompt said Tom is struggling to produce enough bagels to meet demand. Sally has a faster method of making bagels that would allow Tom to keep up. See, the suggestion is that she could support in the execution of this plan. The filtering option says Sally needs a new supplier selling much cheaper flour. If she makes a deal with him, she'll be able to produce bagels at a lower price. But this will drive the price of bagels below three dollars. So if she has this option, that will undermine the production of the outcome. And the flexible roles case says a new high-end developer development goes up near Tom's store, making it much more convenient for the trendier customers to visit his store rather than Sally's. Although see, she hasn't used it previously, Sally has the capacity to produce a large number of regular bagels, so they could basically switch business models. Then we also asked them some further measures. One was the together togetherness measure, which I will talk about. The others were just measures that we had already asked in other experiments. We've done experiments with various differences, so different directions. We asked about rights to rebuke. We asked about different kinds of obligations. We've had different morality levels. So sometimes people are robbing a bank. Sometimes they're doing something good. We asked some of those measures here too at the end, just to see if they replicate. Uh, but the one I'm going to focus on is togetherness. So. 
So this was the togetherness measure. It was the same as in the walking together case. And the other key measure for this was the answerability question. So in the, after they got the disposition to help prompt, they were asked, would Sally go to an explanation if she doesn't share her method? So she doesn't do the helping behavior that Bradman says would be required. In the filtering option, same thing, but if she does the behavior that goes against what Bradman says would be present, and in the flexible roles, again, this time they owe it to each other because each of them would fail to do kind of thing. Our predictions were that participants would be sensitive to the different forms of sociality, which we think will be tracked by the together, togetherness measure, and that scores on the other measures will be lower in the strategic reasoning group compared to the shared agency. We found that for some, like the notification measure, but I think the one that's most important is the answerability. Here are the results. So on the disposition to help prompt, again, this is a statistically significant result. Um, it's the same kind of box plot that we saw before. We also get that very similar, even stronger result on the filtering option and the same for the flexible roles option. Javier, again, assures me that these are all statistically significant, and I believe. <laughs> Here is the comparison. And this is the togetherness measure. Interestingly, the baseline for the strategic reasoning case was higher than our control conditions in the walking together case. You apparently cannot compare things in different studies in that way, but I do think that it's a kind of interesting result. So people did judge this to be more together than the control condition previously, but this is a much higher togetherness score in the shared agency condition. So clearly the different vignettes triggered a different framing of the situation in our participants' mind. They judged them to be more together, and they judged them to be answerable to one another for all of the Brahminian behavioral features. So to summarize the current result, it looks like participants are sensitive to the contrast between strategic interaction and shared agency, and it looks like there's some norm of answerability that's associated with shared agency and applies to all of the Brahminian behavioral features, potentially others. We didn't test some of the Gilbert So now we turn to the question what does this mean? What can we conclude from this? So I think as a very initial pass, this does seem to be evidence in favor of Ratman's distinctiveness claim. We have a behavioral regularity predicted by the action theoretic models, and we have an explanation of it that fits, since that's what generated our conditions. And at least initially, it might seem unclear how a game theoretic model could explain this. But I think this claim needs to be very carefully interpreted, and I think it requires several auxiliary assumptions. Within the philosophical literature, each side was using thought experiments. So in our earlier research, we had a direct conflict of thought experiments between Bradman and Gilbert, and each side, in some sense, was offering those thought experiments as evidence for their view. Bradman is doing this here, but the game theorists are not. Game theory does not see itself in this way, it's a social scientific theory, at least on the understanding that we're using here. And it might be aimed at explaining behavior independently of how those agents conceive of it, at least according to many game theorists. So I think it's less clear what follows from our from a confirmation of our hypothesis in this case. And I think in order for it to have some importance, we need to make some further assumptions. So one is that we have to explain actual human sociality and practical reasoning. Some game theorists see game theory purely as a mathematical exercise. If that is the case, for those game theorists, they can go ahead and ignore the results. It has nothing to do with that. Others see it as a kind of mathematical model that at times captures what human beings are doing, but at times not. But it's not something that's guiding human beings in any way. It's not guiding practical reasons. So there's a, but there's another brand called psychological game theory, which doesn't think necessarily that we have utility maximizing cognitive mechanisms built in, but then at times we do what game theory recommends because it's the way that maximizes utility, times it's used for modeling and reasoning, and so I think we can only really address those people. The next assumption is the one that takes us from research about folk psychology to actual behavior. So I think here we have to make an assumption like folk psychological conceptual categories and forms of explanation help to generate behavior. In other words, what I'm thinking is that how people behave depends in part on their conceptual scheme and how they understand the social environment. 
That would give credence to the claim that our results are likely to be reflected in people's actual behavior. That is something that we hope to test in the future, but it requires a different methodology and more research by <laughs> Because of this, we think that if the aim is the explanation of behavior and folk psychology has this kind of effect, then it's important to get the folk psychology right. And that's the thing that we think that this research can contribute to. Still, I want to emphasize that we think that experimental research is still just a prompt and guide for theory development, revision, and selection. The claim is not that it's impossible to incorporate these things into a game theoretic model. It's just that it might be a good reason to engage in some refinements. These refinements are nothing new given the rise of behavioral and experimental game theory. I mean, in this most general form, it's just an algebra, so it's a system of symbols and rules for manipulating those symbols so that we can generate models of behavior. It's a very flexible set of tools. In theory, it could explain any kind of behavior. Um, but I think that there are some responses that this new wave of game theorists can readily appeal to in order to explain this. So in order to explain some anomalous results from what's called the ultimatum game, some game theorists have positive preferences for fairness among humans, and then constructed a utility model that responds to those preferences. So while that specific preference, I think, is not relevant here, their similar strategy is always open to a game theorist. It's always possible to construct a new model based on some kind of social preference that will explain any kind of behavior. Um, but there's a warning here, too. Simply creating models that respond to data isn't very useful. The models that they create should also be able to generate predictions about the future. And so there should be some kind of stable preference that they're positive to do so. Um, I think one way of reconciling these two approaches might be to suggest that shared intentions, maybe along with things like promises for agreements, are ways of changing people's preferences and expectations. So they modify a game from one to the other, perhaps. Another modification that uh, to the original game theory that's maybe relevant here is something like team reasoning. So people like Bacharach and Sudden and Gold have developed a model of game theory that involves not asking the question, what's best for me, but instead what's best for us. So they argue that there are things like team preferences and these things can feature their own utility functions. I'm not exactly sure how that explanation would work in this case, but it seems to be the kind of thing that might be useful in generating an explanation of the kinds of behavioral features associated with shared agency. One question that remains for this response is what's called the framing problem. So it's unclear whether they have successfully offered grounds for people reasoning in an individual way or reasoning in a team way. And I think that's something that shared intention might be able to do. So one thing that shared intentions do is generate team reasoners in particular contexts rather than individual. So again, I think there's a potential way to reconcile this approach. And finally, there's been an increasingly lively debate among philosophically-minded economists and economically-minded philosophers about whether uh, a game-theoretic model of social norms is possible. So without wading into that debate, debate directly, I think this might also be a promising line of response. Um, it might be the case that people with shared intentions generate a script that has certain norms embedded within it that match up to these Brandbanian behavioral features. Um, this is a line that Christina Bagheri takes to social norms in general. To her, these are not solution concepts like Nash equilibria, but they change the structure of the social situation that the participants are in and modify the type of game that they're playing. So what might look like a prisoner's dilemma or a mixed motivation game when their social norm is present changes to some other game. And the outcomes that agents bring about that look as if they are violating rationality in the prison dilemma are actually Nash equilibrium of this other game. So that might be a possible response here, too. Nonetheless, I think that even if game theorists take one of these routes, our results will have served their purpose of theory refinement. That is, we can conceive of these kinds of claims as a contribution to making this particular trend of game theory a better predictive theory with respect to adult humans, rather than as fund fundamentally undermining the game theory approach. And as I have suggested, with some of the possible lines of response, 
it might be valuable to incorporate shared intentions directly into those models. Interestingly, some game theorists have done this for reciprocity. They argue that it's impossible to model reciprocity without having some understanding of the intentions of others to model. So that's a possibility here too. I'd like to fill out that last suggestion a little bit without committing myself to a game theoretic understanding of social norms. So what I'd like to suggest is that we can think of the kinds of norms involved in shared agency as norms of solidarity on whatever account of norms we have. I think the reason for this is that at least on one understanding, solidarity is about sharing fate. And shared agency is the sharing of agential fates. On accounts of shared intention, one person's intention is successful only if everybody else's are. So each participatory intention depends on the success of every participatory intention with some modifications for people dropping intentions on the way and so on. But especially on the account where it's about conditional intentions about other conditional intentions, our shared intentions bottom out in individual intentions that stand or fall together. This would depart from the game theoretic explanations because you might not use a game theoretic understanding of norms. It would also depart from a Bratmanian story and a Gilbert Gilbertian story since these things wouldn't be part of the shared intention as they are for Gilbert, but they would always be triggered by them, unlike a Bratmanian model. I also think that they would be useful for reinforcing the commitment embodied in the shared intention. They would reduce uncertainty about others' contributory actions. They can increase group cohesion and identity. So there's a lot of sense to be made of groups generating these kinds of norms for their collective actions. And I think they would play an important role potentially in allowing people to build the collective power necessary to achieve their joint aims. Thinking of things this way and researching both people's attitudes to what they owe each other when they act together, and their actual behavioral practices in future research, I think could be helpful in theorizing about how to build solidarity in these small scale cases, but also about maybe some of the difficulties in expanding or extending those models of solidarity in small scale cases to instances where it's very difficult to act with other mistakes, large distances. So in any case, returning to some more definite claims, I think that it's reasonable to conclude for now that our that a confirmation of our hypotheses is plausibly interpreted as supporting three ideas. One is that the action theoretic model better captures what's going on in our everyday understanding of sociality. We recognize intuitive differences between strategic action and shared agency, and we associate certain norms with shared agency, but not strategic interaction. I think there's some initial plausibility to Bratman's distinctiveness claim. So we should resist the kind of default model of game theory at the very least that posits only uh, selfish preferences or doesn't include social norms or some combination. And so we do have some evidence that shared agency is distinct from strategic interaction. And I think that until those further refinements have been developed, it's safe to conclude that shared attention explains these behavioral features better than any psychological model currently modified. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I got a few things I wanted to ask. I think I'll try asking something about solidarity first. So, uh, I yeah, this is sort of half baked, but what I'm aiming at is a feature of solidarity that I feel will be hard to capture with the shared intentions thing. So it might undermine the move at the end or, or the proposal. The, the shared intentions thing is going to capture solidarity norms. Uh, and that feature is, at least in one sense of the term solidarity, often it, it can seem to justify like leveling down. Mm -hmm. So I might refuse a benefit that I can't share with you and I can't give to anyone else. So it would only make me better off in order for us to like stay on the same sort of level because I want to maintain a sort of sense of solidarity with you. Mm -hmm. And is it, it, I feel like that's quite a, a heavy duty thing to 
to explain why that would be justified on the basis of having a shared intention. That, that's the, the rough thought. Is that making sense? Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, just to start out, this is the most future of the future research yeah, yeah. in this part. So I don't have a work theory of solidarity in general that I can use to explain that. What I do think, though, is that there are several different conceptions of it. One is this redistributive mechanism. I mean, a lot of talk about solidarity concerns, how to generate dispositions to accept welfare states, for example. <laughs> I think that is an important kind. I just don't think that this is the kind of thing that could explain that. Yeah. So I think this is my way into a new topic. What I want to say is there's a deep connection between solidarity and collective action. Solidarity is a way of acting together powerfully. And these norms are something that would allow us to do that. So it might be a particular kind of solidarity. It might only apply these kinds of cases. I'm thinking of it in the other direction. So I'm thinking solidarity will explain the norms of collective action rather than shared intention will explain in solidarity yeah. more generally. Um, and I don't think that this is going to explain all of the kinds of solidarity people are interested in. Yeah. Okay. So One more thing was about the team reasoning uh, a bit. Mm -hmm. So I I might be misremembering what the framing uh, problem was, um, but I was so the thing that you said about how shared intentions can like help the team reasoning thing get around the framing problem because it explains why you do team reasoning instead of strategic interaction. It's because you've got the shared intention. I was wondering why the framing problem wouldn't just reoccur, mm -hmm. but why why you've got the shared intention to begin with uh, mm -hmm. instead of just strategically reasoning in that case. So don't, don't you have just the same problem of how you get into the shared intention as how you get into the team reasoning framework? But I, yeah. That is an interesting question. I'm not sure. There is a kind of perhaps lack of ability to translate between these different languages. So when I think of the reasons that people have for engaging in shared agency, performing shared intentions, they don't come to me in game theoretic terms coming from action theory. I do think that on this kind of explanation, there are going to be some things that are external and explain what's going on after they've occurred. So team reasoning is not going to explain why people form shared intentions. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure that uh, the regular models, because they don't include intention as their, as part of the model, usually are going to have an explanation for why people form intentions in the first place. But sometimes, I'm thinking of this in the model of like promising. So sometimes game theorists will say, well, there's this other thing promises. And they change people's preferences and expectations downstream. And that explains how like people end up fulfilling their promises because now the possible sanction for not doing so is a cost that's involved. And so it changes the social situations kind of some of this circumstance. And so I'm thinking of shared intention along those. Yeah. So it might not, you might not be able to get a team reasoning explanation for why the shared intention was formed, but once the shared intention is formed, there's a new social context yeah. and that creates teams. I just have a very basic question about the about the plots that you showed us mm -hmm. and the experiment, mm -hmm. because you described the bagel shop experiment and the two owners, um, and I had understood that you gave the participants of your of the research that story and asked them the questions that you showed us. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand. So was the idea to ask them whether this was strategic interaction or shared agency and that's what the two box plots represented and since the shared agency box plots were higher up that meant that they covered more of the answers sorry i'm just asking a very yeah. basic question about how to interpret it no, no, <laughs> but i think i can answer that one okay okay <laughs> uh, no so the participants only saw one okay uh, so they were like they started the study and they were randomly assigned to one or the other so the people who saw the strategic reasoning case didn't see the shared agency case so you only told us about this shared agency case. Uh, no, those, those box plots show both. So 60 people saw the strategic reasoning case and then answered the questions. 60 people saw the shared agency case and then answered the exact same questions. I and then their differences were represented in the box plots. So the, it was a scale of zero to 100. Then all the questions were numeric, so like to what extent does she owe an explanation? And the answers were, you know, the median average for the shared agency case was much higher than 
Okay. And the way that you described the story to us was both the shared agency yes. and the strategic interaction. So I said, here's this, they were very similar stories. We tried to make them as close as possible. So the same names, the same yeah. dog, the same business, and so on. Uh, in one, and the same outcome. So in yeah. each of the cases, we're trying to keep the price at three dollars, but in the strategic reasoning one, it's just the side effect. And in the shared agency one, it's a plan. It's you, sure you describe the story that way. You yeah. describe it as like an outcome rather than describing it as a a, a shared plan between the two owners. Well, we said that they like they the language is kind of like they aim to keep the price at three dollars. Mm -hmm. So it leaves it open, but it makes it clear that they're committed to the outcome as an outcome. So it's an object of their attitudes rather than just deciding it. And the questions work for both, I hope, at mm -hmm. least. And so that the results are yeah. I'm glad you brought up the Vagal shop. I'm not a philosopher, but I am a lawyer. Okay. Have you given any thought to the fact that your bagel shop scenario is illegal? I have. Yeah, 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 because the other case is not a, you know, it's pretty bad it is between them. But our earlier research suggests, and this is something that we really want to spend a lot of time on, because I find it fascinating, is that people think that these normative relations exist between co-actors, even when the action is immoral or illegal. So we didn't think that would change in this case. Um, I'm not just saying it's well understood. I mean, that this may happen, and there's a body of law that's designed to prevent it. So, yeah. One more question about the biggest yes. shot. And so, it's in fact feasible. I don't understand why this cheaper supply of flour would bring the price down. Why wouldn't they just make her profit higher? <laughs> that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. There's no thing that says your price is connected to the cost of materials. Yeah. Anything that's profit is added value. So her payoff for finding a cheaper supplier could bring profit to both of them if she shared that. Doesn't mean they have to lower the price. Yeah. Okay. Especially since they're colluding to keep the price higher. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But putting that aside, that it may yeah. be a common moral practice. Yeah. There's no reason for her to say that it's not a cost plus delivery mm -hmm. of the product. So I think that's a flaw here. Yeah, those are both excellent suggestions. So one thing that I'm really interested in is that even though it's illegal and perhaps immoral, and I agree with things, the participants thought that they were answerable to one another for engaging in that illegal practice. Like well, sure, so did the five families in Godfather. Okay, yeah. but I mean, they were doing things that were illegal. But that's, a, I think that's a kind of the honor of like thieves. I yeah, it's sure. one that I'm fascinated by because when we ask them whether it's a wronging, we didn't do that here. People say yes. Yeah, and I find that kind of amazing. Well, when they both end up in the prisoner's dilemma question, answering to the feds about price mix, and they're just going to say the other one. Told yeah, yeah. Um, and then on the other point, yes, we did. We did have the correct theory of economics clearly. <laughs> But I think the most important thing is the way that it's described. So we will run, we could run with a different vignette, and we are planning on doing it. One of the things we want to test is because this is a market interaction. One of the reasons that we did that is that there's research that suggests that traditional default game theory models work best when things are described in market terms. So we wanted to use a market example as like a weakest case for our purposes. So we are planning on doing it with all kinds of and seeing whether or not we get differences based on the categorization of the action. So like if it's an outdoor activity, like camping or hiking, if there are high stakes, if it's hard to leave, if there are costs for exit, like these are all things that we'd like to test along the side. So we will do other cases, we'll see if they differ. But I think the most important thing in this case is the way that it gets described to the participants. I'm not sure they have a working theory of economics that would point out this difference. And it's described to them as deviating from the outcome. Um, in ways that benefit one another. That's the like general characteristic that we're trying to get at. So hopefully we find ways of doing that that don't involve illegal actions 
and don't involve mistaken economic. Well, let me just, if you don't mind, uh, one more comment, which is that in law for centuries, a fundamental question has been asked, which is when is a contract formed mm -hmm. between people? Mm -hmm. Now, a contract doesn't mean a written contract, that is simply memorialization of what is called a meeting of the lives. And so intentions are quite important, as well as your filtration system of whether it's feasible for somebody to live up to their promise and whether I should know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the law school exam question, for example, might be, if you meet me at Tiffany's tomorrow, I will buy you a diamond necklace. Okay, so the condition that I set up for my behavior is your showing up at Tiffany's. Mm -hmm. If I was a CUNY undergraduate adjunct professor, mm -hmm. you would filter out the rationale of me and being able to buy you a diamond necklace, and so you wouldn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. If I was Jeff Bezos, you might say, you know what, because we've made an agreement, a contract. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of variations in contract law that you may benefit of picking up a textbook yeah. on contract law. Yeah. When is an agreement formed between people, especially if there are monetary or other kinds of consequences? And the answer usually divides to two cases, which is that there are uh, obligations that are informal and have informal consequences. I'm peeling off at 59th Street, not telling about why or that I'm even leaving, which may be socially acceptable in Ukraine, but not here. I don't know, because there are bombs falling or something. Yeah. But uh, there's also formal agreements, which have formal consequences for disturb them disturbing on mm -hmm. And both of them have, you know, basically the same framework, which is what's their obligation and their agreement. I encourage you to look at that. Church. I will. I think it's relevant for the kind of social norms idea. So some people have social norms that are sure distinguished between social norms and legal norms. Others see the legal norms as kind of social norms. So understanding all of this kind of stuff is going to be important for working out that last suggestion. I mean, people have been rummaging through these questions for a long time, and yeah. in some places they're caught from. So yeah. uh, they're important. And that's the beauty of this kind of methodology is you know, just pick up on things like this and then see. All right. Um, thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, so one distinction I really like in this space is the difference, the distinction between like intending that and intending to. Yeah. Uh, it's like shall be versus shall do kind mm -hmm. of intentions. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, the account, because this is sort of about the background, right? The, the view of shared agency that, that you're running with uh, at the beginning, mm -hmm. whether the shared intention has to be an, an, intent, an, intent, an intending that, um, right? So is that the case or? Yeah, that's the case for Brad. So and, and for you as well? Uh, I also think so. Okay. <laughs> um, I did not think so previously, but I have changed my mind about it. Okay. Um, I think what's important about intention is that it is something that you can genuinely believe will come about by your intending to do it as a minimal thing. And sometimes that's a proposition of your own action. So intentions that are legitimate in those kinds of cases. Right. Another, perhaps more conciliatory way to go about it, which I'm fine with, is Kirk Ludwig, who says you can certainly talk about intentions that, they just bought about in intentions too. So, and I think that works. But I think that works for these kinds of cases too. So I'm happy to take up either approach. It's just that when you, uh, on certain accounts of shared intention and you have these intentions to say about the joint activity, it's hard to make sense of them without using the concept of intention that. Right. And I, I'm okay with it given what I think intentions are. Okay. And then the intendings to do that it bottoms out in would be sort of personal intentions and not shared intentions. Yeah, they'd ultimately be basic actions, okay. according to the logic. Um, that's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> and but, I like, so I, I like sellers on this yeah. kind of stuff. And uh, I know there are we, in, we intendings to do. Mm -hmm. And um, those are, I mean, those those are important to have. And, and one reason I think this matters here is when you're sort of pitting the um, game theoretic versus action theoretic models against each other, 
it sort of leaves out this other space where it's it's um, we're thinking about individual behavior from the private or personal point of view, not shared intentions, but intentions are doing are doing the work mm -hmm. rather than expectation preferences, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So there's an action theory uh, account of unshared intentional action that's just kind of missing. That's just kind of missing here, and I think it would be really helpful to pick that missing account from the shared intentions account. Yeah. So the missing account is the seller's one, which is the missing one. Well, so you you were talking about well, there's the action theoretic account that has shared intentions. Yes. Right, and then there's the game theoretic account. Right. Yes. I'm saying there's another account of you're explaining an individual's behavior by appeal to intentions, but they're private intentions. Yeah. No, no, I intentions. Oh, oh, okay, right. Yeah. And I think we really want to have test cases between those two, between those two I models. See. And if it's an intending that, the differences are uh, implicit. So if I, if I say, it shall be the case that the war ends, mm -hmm. and you say, indeed, um, is that a shared intention or not? Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's ambiguous. Even though it's a shared, it, it potentially is, um, but it potentially isn't. I don't think that it is. I don't think that's a shared. It's a shared goal? Perhaps. Yes. So it's a, it's a we intending that. Um, I don't I don't uh, employ the concept of read attention. Okay. So I don't really think that we need to posit a sort of special cognitive ability to have these we attitudes or to explain shared agency because I think individual conditional intentions will do so. And we already need individual conditional intentions for all kinds of other reasons. And so if we have that, we need it already, it explains shared intention, that's the best model. Um, so I don't rely on the concept of we intention. I think that the concept of intention that is harmless, so I'm happy to, to use it. But I, I'm, I like the suggestion, I have to think about that. If you just have an outcome that's brought about by individual intentional behavior that has a certain pattern, whether that will have some difference to strategic reasoning kinds of cases. And we didn't test that. That's an interesting thing. So I think it to be your suggestion that there are kind of two differences here. It's not just the sort of um, strategic reasoning shared intention. There's the in-between one where it's just individual intentions that result in some collective outcome that still might go beyond preferences and expectations. And we should test those as well. Right. Um, that's an excellent suggestion, and we will do that. I'm hesitant to call those instances of acting together to some extent. So what I'm thinking is the kind of uh, path formation stuff that cognitive scientists have studied. This to be familiar to all of you that's often on college campuses. You see these desire paths between various like walkways. And under certain conditions, cognitive scientists have discovered that those paths are actually solutions to very complicated calculations about how to reach the most distances with the least amount of path space. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's no shared intention to do so. It's individual acting on individual intentions, but solve this kind of collective problem. So that's a kind of in-between thing. There's not strategic reasoning necessarily, at least not in the game theory sense. Maybe over time or something, but also not that probably. And it's in between shared agency and strategic reasoning in some way. So we should test that some way, but we're not answerable to one another in those kinds of cases. There's no shared intention in those kinds of cases. So I'm not sure what our prediction. But it's an interesting suggestion. Thank you. Um, this is probably just a suggestion and connection that came to mind when you were talking. So I don't know how the people that talk about the team reasoning cash that out, but um, I don't know if you've come across this book, Reasoning a Social Picture by Anthony Layden. I have it. It's yeah. Something to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe there's a connection there where it like, uh, develops reasoning itself as a kind of social practice where you're kind of reciprocal and responsive to one another. And when you give reasons, you take yourself to be kind of speaking for the other mm -hmm. and things like this. And maybe that could answer the kind of problem that the team reasoning is trying to answer in a slightly different way. Yeah, so it would solve the framing problem because we would see it in this kind of, and there'd be a kind of like joint or collective reasoning giving sharing process that we're giving. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting suggestion. I'll have to get that book and take a look. Because I am also interested in the team reasoning 
independent. I think it's a very useful, they see it as a kind of extension of traditional theory. And that's also been addressed by some social ontological writers, like Ramon Tuomola has some papers that better address that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, thank you. I'd love to get into some of the ontology stuff, and, and I personally uh, have some thoughts on religious belief and kind of religious traditions and how they might fit in, but but probably those that are, are unique to me, but maybe would be more helpful for everyone. Could you talk a little bit about conversation and maybe how that works? Uh, I guess part of the reason why I'm asking is, are we intending to kind of focus on the subject matter, or is there some kind of, you know, kind of, I don't know if it's a game involvement where it's like we're in this dialogue, and we're kind of doing some sort of you know joint activity, but it seems like you could also say, hey, the whole process can be explained just by you know my intention of the subject matter, like that I'm not focused on the other person as a partner or some sort of you know joint goal. I'm just sort of looking at the subject and trying to unfold everything that's contained in that possible subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, conversation is a particularly interesting act type or shared agency. I've been told that linguists have done lots of research on the norms involved in like entering and exiting conversations and so on. And so that's one of the things that we were thinking of looking at specifically and getting into that literature, just like the sort of contract literature and seeing what we can use to test that kind of stuff. I think there's a difference between uh, genuine conversation and just telling somebody something or just <laughs> exchanging information or something like that. Right. And you can model exchanging information as maybe just involving individual intentions like that. But a conversation is a, to my mind, something involves a shared intention. It's an object of our commitment. And that's what generates, I would argue, the norms that some of these linguists have had. Now, Gene, and I don't know if it's too far off, but you know, discourse ethics and some of that field. You know, as far as bringing in some of the normative, you know, is that a way to kind of like look that there is some sort of, you know, value to sharing or understanding each other or, or kind of doing something together? I don't know if that's kind of more on the solidarity question, but it seems like, you know, at least with Habermas and some of the people, it's like a let's postulate this ideal communication, you know, and, and use that kind of thing, get the normative stuff in through that. But I didn't know otherwise if there is any kind of value that you get from. You know, otherwise, why not just be alone or selfish or? Yeah, I, so I think it's going to be a relatively complicated picture once it's all said and done. What I'm trying to argue is that there are some social norms attached to acting together as acting together, and that those are solidarity norms, and those will apply across collective act types. So they'll apply to conversations, walks together, hikes, and so on. But then each of those act types is going to come with its own norms. I'm not part of Alpine. Club, but I'm sure they have a lot of rules about what's going on at a hike and when you turn around, what to bring, and so on. So, like those norms are going to be distinctive to that kind of effective act type. And I think a lot of our effective act types are going to have things like that, conversations being a primary case. And then that's partly going to depend, depend on like what the purpose of that collective act type is. And if it's an ideal act type aimed at some political value, then the norms are going to be the specific norms that come with that are going to be tied to that. I think in addition, though, there'll be act, uh, there'll be norms that come with it just being an instance of shared agency. I know the one that I was talking about. Can you recommend people that do talk about religion, whether it's religious traditions or beliefs or something where it's like, look, you know, my own individual belief is kind of latched on or, or derivative from this other collective, you know, either theological, you know, people who are you know, making proclamations that are doctrines or I just didn't know maybe where to look at for some of that stuff. Oh, yes. So there are two things that I would recommend. Margaret Gilbert has right. stuff on collective belief that is very interesting. She thinks that you have joint commitments, these kinds of beliefs, that don't actually entail that you individually believe them. <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, so that's one source. The other is uh, a CUNY professor, John Greenwood, who has an excellent account of social belief, where he says that a social belief is one that you have on account of and because of the idea that a group has it, and he's specifically trying to understand religious belief. So that's an excellent place. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can um, study us if we have conversations downstairs <laughs> over uh, at the reception. Uh, so please join me in thanking Matt.